and ESB, thank you very much again for being with us here today. Now, the third session of our conference is entitled Visions for Ireland's Energy Future. And we're delighted to be joined by Minister Dennis Nocton. He'll be in the room in a couple of moments. But just before we get to him, our first speaker in this session is one of Ireland's best known meteorologists. He announced recently that he will be retiring at the end of the year, so he's going to be a much missed face on our television screens. And I imagine the weather's going to change for the worse when he's not telling us what it's going to be. So would you please welcome uh, Ger Fleming to give us a weather forecast for 2050. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, I'm not sure if I can change the weather. In fact, I know I can't, but at least I can maybe change a little bit about your perception of the weather. Um, prediction in a changing world, prediction is what we do. Uh, but I've been at this game now for, for nearly 40 years, so I've certainly seen some changes in the way that uh, the weather that is coming towards us. But when people look at climate change and they look at the numbers and they say, well, a degree or two, what's that going to mean? We need to think a little bit about some of the other aspects of what weather brings to us or doesn't bring to us. And in particular, natural hazards. Most of the natural hazards that occur worldwide are meteorological in origin. Some of them are, are geological, you've got your earthquakes and your volcanoes and that, but in terms of economic loss, in terms of damage, it's the weather or the oceanography or the hydrology, so the seas, the water in one form or another, that really does the damage. Now, this is some interesting statistics that come from the uh, University of Louvain, the Center for Research into the Epidemiology of Disasters. Looking at a 25-year period worldwide, at the number of disasters, and you'll see that flooding and windstorms are the two major blocks, if you like, in that particular disk. Extreme temperature is up there too. Economic losses, it's flooding, it's windstorms, and it's earthquakes. So these are reasons why we need to consider very carefully if our weather patterns are changing. And indeed, if we look at the regional distribution of loss of life in that same 25-year period, over dividing the world into six regions, these are through the UN regions, if you like, uh, we see that flooding, drought, of course, is the big one, and in Africa, half a million people there. But in Europe, the heat wave, the big heat wave in 2003, which affected primarily France, but also parts of Belgium, parts of Germany, Switzerland, Spain, 50,000 excess deaths. Uh, those are big numbers. Uh, we are not in this technologically advanced corner of the world in any way immune from the malign effects of severe weather. And the when we look at it through the lens of economic losses, those pie chart distributions change substantially, but flooding and windstorms still very much a part of that picture. So these are reasons why we need to consider not just the average weather, but the extreme weather, because it's in the extremes that we are seeing and we will continue to see the effects of our changing climate most keenly. Now, most of these graphs I'm going to show you, just to reference back, come from this publication, which was uh, put out by Medairn a couple of years ago, Ireland's Climate, the Road Ahead. We know for many years of these global models, which give us some indication of how the climate is changing on the global scale, but of course we're a little rock perched on the northwest corner of the Eurasian Massif, if you like, with the Atlantic out there. We want to know what does it mean for us in, in our little corner of the world. Uh, and what, how we do that is we take these models, these global models, and we, what we call, downscale them. We run them at much finer resolution over our little island to find out, you know, what are those regional implications of changing climate for our particular part of the world, so that we can begin to plan and so on. So this document, if you like, is a foundation document for infrastructure planning for Ireland for the decades ahead. So let's look at two different aspects, changes in temperature, and changes in rainfall. And in each case, because, of course, weather prediction is such that when we're looking ahead, we don't just look at a single year, that would be silly, we look at a band of years. So we're looking here at averages over the period 2040 to 2060. So that 20-year period straddling the middle of the century, straddling 2050. And we're looking here at four maps of changes in temperature, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And the likely changes are in the order of a couple of degrees and probably a little bit more in the latter part of the year than in the earlier part of the year. In the summer, it's more towards the south and southeast of the country. In the winter, 
it's more towards the north and northeast, but all places seeing that increase in temperature. So you might say, so what? A couple of degrees here or there probably won't make a lot of difference. But uh, if we look at the maximum temperatures, so these are the highest temperatures achieved each day and how those would be changing, and look at under two emission scenarios on the right-hand side, medium to low emissions of, of CO2 and other uh, greenhouse gases. On the left-hand side, the higher emission scenario, which is effectively the emission scenario we're currently on globally. Um, then you see much, much larger numbers there in the likely increase in maximum temperature. Now, if we think back to that big uh, number of people who died from heat stress in mainly France in 2003, uh, we've done some work and with colleagues here in, in Dublin looking at the effect of heat stress on the Irish population, then you'd be surprised at how low the numbers are, 26, 27 Celsius, you know, not really very hot weather for those of us who may have been on holiday in Spain or whatever, but at those sorts of temperatures, we begin to see an increase in admissions to hospital, people with respiratory illnesses, elderly people by and large, uh, not entirely. Uh, so we're getting into that sort of territory now when we look at the Tmax uh, rises, if you like, in the summer months. And then the minimum temperature is rising even more. So the likelihood of nighttime frosts, much, much, much less. So those, those figures, if you like, are, are pretty solid for the sort of changes we're seeing and we will be seeing as we head into the middle of this century, which, uh, you know, it's not that far away now. It's just over 30 years. Some of us hopefully still to be around in those days. In rainfall changes, here we have um, medium to low emission scenarios on the right, summer, drier weather, particularly in the south. On the left, winter, wetter weather in the north and northwest. So looking at an average over the year doesn't mean an awful lot. This actually is looking at a change in the distribution of rainfall, wetter in the winter, drier in the summer. In the high emission scenario, that's even more marked, uh, particularly those wetter winters. And because the atmosphere is, is warmer, it's carrying more moisture, then the propensity for events such as we saw yesterday, such as we saw back in, in August in, in uh, Donegal, where you have these intense periods of rainfall lasting for three, four, five hours, dumping a lot of water, the, the likelihood of that sort of event uh, certainly seems to increase. And, and indeed, we've seen an increase in that even in the last while. Now, that might all seem a little bit theoretical looking forward, but I'm going to show you a very interesting graph here now, which has been compiled by a colleague, head of climatology in, uh, in Medherin. And what he's done is he's looked at the rainfall over winter, just winter. And for us, winter, apologies to any primary school teachers here, winter is December, January, February. Those are the three months of the meteorological winter. Um, and he's averaged the rainfall out over the whole of the island of Ireland. So gone back and done some forensic work with the historical records and tried to get what's one number that would represent the average winter rainfall over the island of Ireland in, say, 1875 or thereabouts. And the graph looks something like this. So starting at 1850 on the left-hand side, you can see the variability. There's dry winters, there's wet winters. Generally, 200 to 400 millimetres seems to be where it is. And the average is probably somewhere around 320 millimetres. And that really continues right up until the turn of the millennium. Then we had a few dry years. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, we had basically two very wet winters, which were 1314 and 1516 where we had respectively 550 millimetres of rain, and I think it was 602 was that uh, highest peak. Now, the conundrum for us is, is this just a statistical anomaly? When we come back in 2100 and look at this graph, will those peaks be just standing out from the background, or are they part of something new and something different? Scientifically, we don't know the answer to that question yet. What I would say is that if you were going to a bookies, and putting on a bet to be collected in 2100, I suspect he'd be laying odds that uh, the statistical anomaly option might not be the one, it might be the longer odds. That's the question. So, with all of that, if I were heading out to, uh, to RTE to do a weather forecast in the year 2050, what sort of things would I be likely to be talking about? Well, if it was a winter month, I'd certainly be looking at more Atlantic storms because we saw that wetter, milder profile, and that's consistent with more, more Atlantic weather, more weather coming in from the west, more stormy weather, more rain. So the Shannon, the Barrow, the Blackwater, those rivers, those kind of relatively long, slow rivers, likely to be fuller, and those towns along those rivers likely to be more at threat. Frost, probably unlikely. We're already seeing in many countries that when they look at winter, whatever way you define it, winter has shortened by about one month. That's been measured in the US, it's been measured in New Zealand, very little frost, it's likely to be measured here too. 
higher seas, already a factor a couple of years ago with Hurricane Sandy as it impacted the northeast coast of the US. The seas in that part of the Atlantic are already 60 to 70 centimetres higher than they were in the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, that's a, a fairly significant rise in sea level, and then you put a, a hurricane and storm surge on top of that. Increased risk of coastal flooding, Dublin, Arklow, Wexford, all those towns that the Vikings left us around the coast, which uh, well built for your longships, but maybe with the sea levels increase, we're going to see problems there. In the summer, well, warmer and drier, maybe more heat stress for the elderly. The east and southeast, possibly more frequent droughts there, uh, which will mean water shortages. Most of our population is in the east and the southeast, as we know. Uh, for our dairy farmers and our beef farmers, the grass growth, which they rely on, I suppose, and which our industry is built on, less reliable. On the other hand, maybe the grain more reliable. So pluses and minuses maybe, but in general, it's probably not something we'd want to look forward to. Thank you. While we're waiting for the Minister to join us, and will be with us in a second. Gerald, is there anything that could be done, Gerald, to alleviate all of this, to make sure that what you're suggesting for 2050 may not be quite as bad as all that? So, we can do very little to alleviate the weather risk, the hazard, in the sense that we can do our part along with the rest of the globe in reducing our carbon emissions, and it's necessary that we do our part, and Europe is leading in this, of course. Uh, but it's the response of other countries, and particularly the big uh, emitters, that are going to determine globally what will happen. What we have to do is, is plan for the worst, even if we hope that it might happen. Uh, that's certainly the case in terms of flooding, in terms of building flood defences, which will be predicated on these potentially higher levels of rainfall. Uh, in terms maybe of not building on areas which you know, potentially could be flooded in this higher rainfall, in terms of maybe looking at the different mix in, uh, in our agriculture. I mean, already we've had some requests from IFA groups around the country to come and talk to them about, you know, is it time that we got out of grain in our part of the country and got more into forestry or whatever? So it's at that if we think ahead, imagine what it might be like and plan for it, we can probably, in an economic sense, reduce the impact but we will have to change. Just a couple of things. Technologically now with the advances and scientific advance, are we much better at understanding and predicting near-term weather patterns? Absolutely. Uh, the huge improvement in weather forecasting in the last 15 or 20, 30 years has been driven by two things. First of all, the satellite meteorology, which has just increased the amount of observation of the atmosphere that we have and the number of observation points and so on. But then the computing power and the, what we call the fundamental equations of meteorology. These are mathematical equations that describe what happens to the atmosphere. They're very complex. They need very powerful computers to run them. Those have been improved. The computers have been improved. And the detail we're getting out of those models now is tremendous. And it will continue to improve for some time yet. Uh, that's been driving, if you like, the short-term weather forecast improvement. Yeah, because you're in a much better position now to predict almost hour for hour region by region across the country, what's going to happen over the next 24, 36 hours? Yeah, because we have more detail of what's already happening and we have these models which are run at, the, the, we run ours now at finest resolution of 2.5 kilometres. So 2.5 kilometre grid laid over the whole country is, is a fairly fine resolution grid. Uh, potentially, you know, we can tell the weather at any point, at any time. Now, it's not quite as simple as that. The weather is a chaotic system, so we have to build that into our thinking also. But is it the case now, and this is the final thing, that we do seem to be having more variations within short periods of time in our weather? Even this week, we'd have seen very, very mild and warm two days ago, then suddenly torrential rain yesterday, and now I think we're expecting a much colder night tonight. We're getting into a cold spell now for the next three or four days, and uh, that's not unusual for November. What has been unusual is those very high temperatures that we've seen in the last week. And that very warm air has carried all that moisture, which when it meets the very cold air, then dumps all the moisture down in those very heavy rain bursts. So it's those incursions of warmer and wetter air at this time of the year, which bring us that increased risk of flooding because the warm air carries a lot of moisture. And when it meets the cold air, then that moisture gets dropped out of the air as, as, as rainfall. Gerald Fleming, thank you very much. And good luck in your retirement as well.
Okay, I think I have my microphones working there. I just lost my lapel mic for a second, but we'll please proceed anyway. And our next speaker now, we're delighted that we are joined by, by Minister Dennis Nocton, who is going to give us the government perspective on the low carbon future. Minister for Communications, Climate Action and the Environment, Dennis Nocton. Thanks very much, uh, Matt. Um, and I'm delighted to be here uh, this afternoon. Apologies if I literally have to, to run out the door because uh, we have the finance bill uh, inside in the doll at the moment. And the last thing we need at the moment is the government to, to lose a vote on a money bill. Uh, because based on what Jerry is saying, it wouldn't be nice to be banging on doors with snow running down our, our necks. Uh, but I want to thank you for inviting me here this afternoon. Uh, but I'm also conscious um, that while we're here, the people in Leash are suffering because of, of extreme flooding. Uh, the government's uh, emergency relief uh, plan is in operation with members of the Defence Forces, fire crews and council staff on the ground, uh, saving houses and businesses and farms. My thoughts are with those families evacuated from their homes uh, last night and the business owners who are facing into very difficult days and weeks ahead on the run into Christmas. I suppose coming from the Midlands, I'm only well aware of the devastation that can be caused by flooding. Uh, and as a country, we can all see the impact that severe weather is having, particularly when Storm Ophelia hit here a few weeks ago. I'd like to take this opportunity to again thank and commend the ESB emergency crews, their apprentices, their contract staff, and their EU colleagues who worked around the clock in dangerous conditions to restore power to hundreds of thousands of homes after Storm Ophelia. Your conference uh, here today is timely and your title and theme, Take Charge, is apt. I understand the aim of your discussions is to explore how to link Ireland's low carbon energy future in practical way with the lives of people. As the ESB recently celebrated its 90th anniversary, it's an opportune time to look forward to how we adapt to an evolving uh, energy landscape. While government and industry can provide the framework and tools, it's the people themselves who use these tools that will drive forward our smart and low carbon uh, energy future. People cannot be commanded, they must be consulted. As Minister for Climate Action, I must enable people to take action themselves. The change that is required requires people to become agents and authors of action. Ireland relies on high emission imported fossil fuels to meet 88% of our energy needs. That costs us about 5,000 million euro per annum, or half a million euro every single hour. That's a cost that we cannot afford in cash terms and that our planet cannot afford at all. If, that, uh, if the money that Ireland spends on energy imports uh, can be redirected to energy efficiency and smarter energy services, it will replace imported fossil fuels with local jobs and opportunities for Irish companies. The word global in global warming accurately summarises the incontrovertible science underlying that imminent threat. It is also in the, its vastness, potentially daunting, even discouraging. How can any one country, especially a small one, make a difference? How can any one of us meaningfully act to make a difference? Energy efficiency and climate action are inextricably linked. Using less energy and using it more efficiently is the most cost-effective way to combat climate change. Efficiency is about uh, using the limited resources more responsibly and more economically. It's not just doing things in a different way, it's a different way of thinking. We all have a huge task, compounded by some of the unique challenges that we ha have here in Ireland. The National Climate Mitigation Plan was agreed by government and, and published last July. It was considered in the context of the first full day cabinet meeting on climate and climate related issues. This was a significant move by government. It was the first full day cabinet meeting on a single policy topic for several years. The mitigation plan represents a concerted whole of government approach to reducing Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions. 
The next wave uh, of energy policy drivers will come through the EU's uh, clean energy package uh, published last year. In this package, the European Commission highlights the importance of ensuring that the move to, the clean, uh, to a clean energy system will benefit all Europeans by reaping their tangible benefits of access to more secure, clean and competitive energy. The energy systems of the future uh, require the creation of a significantly more responsive system, a system that will meet the needs of microgeneration. Energy supply companies must be prepared to combine supply and demand and offer services and products that people use willingly. I look forward to studying in detail the ESB's report uh, being launched today, Ireland's Low Carbon Future, Dimensions of a Solution. I welcome the fact that it states an uptake in existing technologies such as heat pumps and electric vehicles will make significant inroads into decarbonising our energy system. It also looks at how the role of the electricity system will change over the coming decades and focuses in particular on how we can make the adjustments necessary to decarbonise our energy system. I welcome this analysis and will help inform the development of the National Energy and Climate Plan 2021 to 2030 as part of the new clean energy package currently uh, being finalised uh, over the coming days in Brussels. Community-led electricity and energy projects offer real opportunity for local economic growth. Better Energy Community Scheme, funded by my department and administered through the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, is an example of a government project that is revitalising communities. This has brought hundreds of communities uh, together, community groups together, to take control of their energy usage and make the system work for them with lower bills, warmer homes and local jobs. I'm announcing today that the scheme will continue next year, bigger and better than ever before. I've secured 28 million euro for the scheme uh, next year. This is a significant budget increase and marks a new record level of funding for community energy. There are incentives for communities that focus on clean and renewable energy. Every application that incorporates solely renewable energy will receive bonus points uh, at the project evaluation stage. Further bonus marks will be awarded for those projects that meet exceptionally high air quality standards. Already more than 100 community groups have agreed to become a sustainable energy community uh, uh, in, partnership, in a partnership agreement with the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. I'm giving a guarantee to community groups today that every single group that agrees to a partnership agreement with the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland will be guaranteed funding for their local energy project. If you can provide the local knowledge, time and people, the government will support you with mentoring, energy expertise and guaranteed funding to support your local energy projects. Achieving a low carbon energy future requires an understanding of the reasons behind why people are not yet fully engaged with energy saving. This understanding is a fundamental part of schemes and programmes that encourage behavioural change. This year I secured funding to establish a behavioural economics unit within the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. This unit is focused on examining how to influence people's behaviour through evidence-based programmes. This is being closely monitored and evaluated and the results will be used in a measurable way to get better target, to better target energy efficiency grant schemes that my department funds. Just as Ardna Crusher nearly 90 years ago, uh, uh, in building Ardna Crusher, we unlocked the potential of a young country. Broadband will unlock the potential today of Europe's youngest population. It will facilitate innovation, support ideas, foster creativity, and help ensure uh, the viability of communities in a globalized world. A key social, economic, and political priority for me is broadband, and delivering on the national broadband plan in particular. This plan will play an integral role in revitalizing businesses and communities across uh, provincial towns and rural Ireland. Smarter use of, electricity, of energy by us all will go hand in hand with the rollout of high-speed broadband across the country. We all know that the big growth area in technology today is the Internet of Things. That is connecting 
ordinary everyday items like cookers and kettles to the internet. There are 6,500 million items connected to the internet today. By 2020, that figure will be 50,000 million items. That's 600 new appliances connected to the internet every second between now and 2020. That provides us with huge potential to turn on and off our heating systems remotely, to make smarter use of energy, to create smarter homes. Broadband is the essential connection that allows people to take action to deliver efficiency. The recent announcement of the new uh, delivery plan uh, for smart meters is welcome. It's a phased rollout of around 2.3 million electricity smart meters that will be installed by electricity ESB networks in homes and businesses nationwide, replacing old mechanical meters. This will lead to greater energy efficiency by empowering people with the information and control about their own energy use. I believe that smart meters and high-speed broadband will lead to a profound change in our behaviour in terms of how and when we consume energy in our homes and in our communities. The energy markets are changing and greater accessibility to alternative, low-carbon intensive energy sources will present opportunities for householders and businesses to make more sustainable energy choices. The greatest problems facing humanity may be global in scale, but their solutions are local, and the key to their implementation is personal. We are all called to be deciders, implementers, change makers, and not passive observers. Goramila Mahagot. Thank you very much, Minister, for taking the time to be with us here today. It is very much appreciated. Now, to successfully complete Ireland's journey to a low-carbon future, it's necessary that policy goes hand-in-hand hand with utility business model changes. Our final speaker in this session, the Chief Executive of the ESP, Pat O'Doherty, is going to outline ESP's vision for a low-carbon future. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just listening to the minister, picking up on a couple of themes that are very relevant to, um, to our, our, our day here today, put an emphasis on community, on customer engagement, um, and employment creation, and uh, as, as we kind of reduce our, our, our dependency on imported fossil fuels, the potential to create employment in new areas linked with the low carbon transition and the energy system of the future. And of course, the, the linkage between broadband, the internet of things, and how that all com comes together uh, in the new future. That was very, very interesting. So thank you, Minister, and we very much appreciate uh, you being here uh, today. I suppose as Gerald Fleming's presentation has already demonstrated, um, climate change presents very, very real and present threat to humanity, and the global effects are already evident. And in fact, as we've seen most recently uh, uh, in Ireland, uh, climate change is impacting on society through storms, flooding, and water shortages, and the disruption of plants, animals, and fisheries. In ESB, we recognize that our activities, the activities of, uh, uh, of the utility sector, are contributing to the problem. Electricity generation accounts for 20% of carbon emissions uh, in Ireland, but this is on a downward trajectory. Since 1992, the carbon uh, trajectory, uh, the carbon intensity of electricity generation in Ireland has halved as high carbon emitting plants have been replaced by renewable and lower carbon alternatives. ESB has invested significantly in electricity networks to enable this to happen, connecting over 3,000 megawatts of, of onshore wind onto the system. And, in, and uh, this has enabled more than 27% of electricity to be generated from wind in, uh, last year. This is the second highest penetration of wind in Europe. Over time, the carbon emissions from electricity will make up less and less of our national carbon inventory, thanks to effective policy measures that today are driving innovation and change in the sector. Existing policy measures uh, will completely eliminate uh, carbon from electricity generation by 2050. But this will not go far enough. 
Over the past, past few years, uh, the Minister and his officials have identified the targets and the policies that will help to drive Ireland's low carbon future. And this has culminated in the publication of a white paper in 2015, which set out a vision for reducing energy emissions by 80 to 95% by 2050 and full decarbonisation thereafter. Um, in effect, uh, what this actually means uh, that between now and 2050, and this is a quite a staggering challenge, that Ireland must reduce its carbon emissions from, from energy from 38 million tonnes to 6 million tonnes. That is the scale of the, of, of the energy challenge, the decarbonisation challenge uh, for Ireland. And in that time, our population will go up by 30% and we'll have a million more cars on the roads and another half a million more houses. Uh, we in ESB, we've been seeking to understand what these targets actually mean in practical terms and what options are available for Ireland to achieve them. And to gain an independent and objective uh, view of this, we engage international consultancy for Empoiry to work with us in analysing existing roadmaps and to identify possible technologies that would allow Ireland to reach its carbon reduction targets. And together we've developed a dimension, what we call a dimensions a report, and they, uh, it's the dimensions of a solution for Ireland that prioritises investment towards those areas that will have the greatest impact on energy emissions uh, and in the shortest possible time frame. Through this process, we've attempted to show a technically feasible and, uh, and a practical pathway to different, uh, a very different energy future. One where air quality is significantly better, where people live more comfortable and convenient lives, and where a mix of low carbon and renewable technologies are used to generate sustainable electricity. In our vision of the future, chimneys will no longer feature in new houses, and cars will no longer have tailpipes. In developing a roadmap for Ireland, we looked at the probable shape of a low carbon energy system in 2050. Using technologies that exist today, that's important because you know, we're, we're in the investment time horizon now for 2050, so it's important that we focus on technologies that exist today. And we considered So we considered, and this is important also, how we minimise the risk of stranding assets. It's important that as we make these investments that we minimise the risk of those investments subsequently becoming stranded. So it's a series of low regret options. And in particular, we looked at potential solutions for transport and heating and the electricity generation sectors, which together make up over 50% of our carbon emissions. And two very clear winners surfaced from this analysis, both of which will deliver immediate and long-term solutions to Ireland's carbon reduction challenge. Heat pumps and electric vehicles. By 2050, we envisage that in meeting our targets, 60% of all households will have a heat pump and that electric vehicles will account for 60% of new car sales. At about 75% efficiency, electric vehicles are three times more efficient than internal combustion engines. And heat pumps are three to four times more efficient than the most efficient domestic heating boilers. Even with our current electricity generation mix, they can reduce carbon and improve uh, air, air, air quality now. As electricity generation continues on this trajectory towards zero carbon, further reductions in emissions will then accrue. Both technologies are proven, they're available today, and they are capable of halting the growth in our carbon inventory. They have the potential to give Ireland an early start in two of Ireland's most carbon intensive sectors, transport and heating. And this is, an, this is a problem that's unique to Ireland, which together account for over one third of our national carbon emissions. The technology options to replace coal and other carbon intensive sources of generation are less clear cut. What is clear cut though, is that we will have to have zero carbon alternatives to peat and coal generation by the end of the next decade. No one technology has emerged as a replacement for this large scale thermal generation. And it is very unlikely that one single solution will prevail. All existing options, CCS, gas, solar, onshore wind, offshore wind, ocean and biomass, all have limitations in terms of affordability and energy security. 
High efficiency gas will, will provide an important transition to meet interim targets while keeping the lights on and will enable more renewables to come on stream. However, beyond 2030, we anticipate that a combination of high efficiency CCS gas, onshore wind, solar and biomass will be required to fully displace carbon from the system. Our analysis draws from extensive expertise, both from within the company and from outside. And we hope that this will provide useful insights for policymakers and for the wider energy sector. A synopsis is contained in your packs. And the full version of the report uh, will be available uh, from today on our website. Within ESB, the report into Ireland's low carbon future has informed our own strategic direction out to 2030, which is anchored in our ambition to create a brighter future for our customers and for society by leading the transition to a low carbon future. Over this period, we will completely transform our generation portfolio, renewing older thermal plant with a mixture of renewables and high efficiency gas to cut the carbon intensity from our fleet by 50%, provide flexible backup to enable more renewables to come on stream. By 2030, about 40% of our generation will be from renewable sources, including hydro, on an offshore wind, solar, and biomass. Marguerite Sears, the Managing Director of ESB Networks, already covered our networks program this morning. It's another essential building block in our strategy. By improving network intelligence and, and completing the rollout of smart technologies and smart meters, we will support much more renewables on the system and facilitate tariff innovation by suppliers. Um, using smart technologies, we'll harness the potential of the distributed energy resource, including battery storage, demand-side response, and embedded generation, electric vehicles, and heat networks to facilitate new services and create a more sustainable energy system. We will invest significantly in our electricity networks, including new smart technologies, as I said, to enable the widespread electrification of heating and transport and to put the customer right at the center of a reimagined electricity system. And as we've already heard over the course of today, the willingness of customers to engage with new technologies and become more active participants in this new energy landscape will be a key determinant in achieving our ambition to achieve a carbon-free energy system. Also, the ability and the willingness and the motivation of the industry to engage with customers and to engage, as we've seen, over the course of the various discussions this morning with customers and put customers at the centre stage and, and understand the needs of customers will be critical. So we're working to develop insight-driven uh, products and services that address the needs of customers. And for example, our smart energy services business is partnering with large energy users to help manage their electricity use more efficiently, reducing their consumption and carbon output significantly, and as well as delivering paid-for services back to the grid. There are many similar innovations happening across the company. Implementing this strategy will be driven by government policy and will collaborate with stakeholders and partners across the industry, including many here in the room today, to really realise this shared vision of a low-carbon society. ESB was created 90 years ago by people who had a vision for society and who believed in the power of electricity as an agent for social and economic progress and for change. This ambition and intrinsic motivation to serve society continues to drive us in ESB today and to shape our values. As we look ahead to 2027, our 100th anniversary and beyond, we're motivated by a potential to create a brighter energy future, one where electricity will play a much bigger role and where our deep understanding of customers will drive innovation and lead to a seamless, integrated and outstanding customer experience. Our ambition is, to, is that from 20% of the problem today, we are looking forward to a future where electricity will be over 50% of the solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Pat is staying with us for the panel discussion that we will be having after our next session. Um, 
this would be the third session of our Take Charge conference, and we're going to, our speakers are going to explore the opportunities for electrification that our journey to a low carbon future opens up. Now, as you can see on the program, this session will have a panel discussion on electrification uh, as well. And we look, invite you again to submit your questions to Slido at any point during the session. And we look forward to using them in a discussion later on. They were most useful to me in the morning sessions. Uh, they certainly brought me into areas that I wouldn't have thought of personally, but I know that are very much of interest and importance to you. So please do use Slido again to make sure that we actually have the best possible conversation. So, if I could ask our two speakers maybe to join us on stage for this thing, and I'll, I'll introduce them in a second. The, the first person who is going to be talking to us with a presentation on energy efficiency, uh, which has become a crucial element of our transition to a low carbon future, Paul Kenny, the chief executive of the Tipperary Energy Agency, is a leader in retrofitting, and he's now going to give us a presentation on the innovative ways in which we can save energy and money in our homes. So to talk about the energy efficient home, please welcome Paul Kenny, the chief executive of the Tipperary Energy Agency. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, Okay, so Matt's done the introduction. Everyone has a home, so this presentation is going to be relevant for everyone. Um, and maybe not, er maybe not all the graphs uh, are, but I, I hope to maybe outline where we're all going in our homes um, and outline some of the things that we've done to, to, to maybe demonstrate uh, where we're going um, with the, I suppose, the energy efficient and renewably powered home. Um, and I think it's, it's worth just looking at the, the top right-hand picture, that's Pat Rabbit uh, installing some insulation on a wall in, in a social house in, in Tipperary. And, you know, we very much uh, focused a lot of our efforts in some of the lower-income houses for, for a number of years. Um, but we really struggled with the idea of what's powering these homes. Um, and we really felt that the oil and gas that we were using to, to power our homes, and in many cases, solid fuel and peat, uh, was not something we wanted to continue with. So I, I try and throw one slide up on every presentation I give about climate change because we tend not to talk about it a lot. Now, we, we have obviously had a speaker here, um, but some of those images that you'll see on the screen um, are, are kind of dawning reality of, of where we are in, in both Ireland as a position, but also the human race in terms of climate change. It has become much more urgent. Um, and we really know we need to get out of fossil fuel use by the end of, of kind of 2040 for electricity and heat. So Ireland needs to, to really get on board with that. And, um, you know, we've seen some reports recently about Ireland's position in climate change um, on a global scale and, and also in the renewable directive as well, negotiations. So it's, it's important that I think we move on and we take charge of the future because we're, we're not there yet. So a little bit of our journey to, to deep retrofit We've, we've completed up, up to 2013, we had, or 2015, we completed about 1,500 homes, what we would consider a shallow retrofit, so um, attic insulation, wall insulation, boilers, heating controls, and so on. And what we found in this graph in the, the bottom right, which was uh, real-time monitoring of 100 homes that we did under the SERV project, which was a, a mixture of European and, and, and SEAI funding, is, is these are retrofitted homes, so the, on the right-hand side, you would have um, C, C1s, B3s, and on the left-hand side, you would have had uh, A3s, B1s. And we really felt that, that even a reasonably well-retrofitted home was still using a lot less energy than predicted. And what does that mean? It means it's cold. So we were monitoring interior temperatures, and we could see very clearly that the temperature correlation was exactly the same as the fuel use. So our, what we thought was quite a good retrofit, um, which would be the, the standard of the, the current better energy homes, um, was not sufficient. It was not a sufficiently deep retrofit. Um, so we, we, we came up with this idea of the near zero energy building retrofit, um, which our marketing and communications person renamed to super homes, um, thankfully. Um, and we, what we tried to do with that is, is figure out the solution for every building and, and put a package together that was supporting the homeowner to make the decision to get to an A3 retrofit. We pitched the idea to, to SAI and they have funded uh, uh, super homes in, in terms of grants 
35 to 50% over the last number of years and have been very supportive about how we demonstrate what this uh, aerated uh, transition for, for a home is. Um, and I'm delighted to, to, to hear that uh, there will be an announcement in six weeks about oil and gas boilers. That's great. Um, so when we looked at it, um, what are the CO2 reduction op options for a home? We've got the rip, rip a, a, a house apart, passive house retrofit where everything is done to the home. Um, rip, take out the ceiling, take out the floor, uh, external insulation, new windows, and, and so on and so forth. And roughly the case studies would say about 80,000 euros additional cost on top, on top of a, a generational retrofit. Um, now, undoubtedly, a fantastic retrofit. And if you have to do a new ceiling and you have to do a new floor, that's what you should do. There's absolutely no doubt about it. However, we thought that's not really going to wash for all of our homes. We need to have something in between. And we came up with the idea of really you know, getting moderately good insulation, moderately good air tightness, moderately good um, fabric performance, and designing a really low cost uh, heating system and renewable heating system with an air source heat pump. Um, and we really struggled at the beginning to figure out how to do that because most people in Ireland in heating said air source heat pumps won't work in Ireland. Um, yet, 20% of Sweden uses air source heat pumps. About 80% of Japanese homes are heated with heat pumps. It was just a question to figure out how. And we very much did figure out how. Um, and, and off we went. So then we thought, well, we now figured out the technical ways. How do we get people to do it? We looked at some of the, the, the things that have happened across Europe. There's a, there's a great one in Picardy where it's, it's a public service for energy efficiency. Um, we also looked at the Green Deal and what worked and what didn't work and, and some German ones. And really, there's a number of barriers there that, you know, people in the audience will probably identify one or two of those barriers as to the reasons why they have not retrofitted their homes. Um, and when we put our package together and we presented it to, to, to some of the, the, the people from SEAI and the department, um, they really felt that, that that kind of guidance process through deep retrofit was really, really important for homeowners. And that's how we bring customers on board. That's how we get people to go from, I don't know what to do, I'd like to be environmentally conscious, um, to I now have a, a 2050 ready home. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we put together this, this infographic just to kind of explain it. So insulation, solar panels on the roof if you want it, an air source heat pump, a ventilation system to make sure we have nice, clean and healthy air. Um, and, 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 you know, that, that's more or less the, the package. Um, but one of the, I suppose, leading European thinkers on, on energy performance, uh, the, the Dutch Green MEP, Claude Humes, he always goes on about this one-stop shop. And it's, it's not about the insulation industry having insulation suppliers and the heat pump industry having heat pump suppliers and the solar industry having solar suppliers. We need to bring it all together and guide a homeowner through. So super homes is more, um, none of the technical things that we do in a super home are, are anything reasonably hard. What we're trying to do really is, is, is to use guidance and, and, and drive people through the process so that they come out the other end in a position where they have a very warm house, um, and, and very low carbon house, very uh, cheap house to run, and all together are very satisfied. And we have incredible levels of satisfaction. One woman told me after spending 15,000, this is the best money I've ever spent in my life. If I didn't save a penny, I would be delighted. Now she's gonna save about three grand a year. Now, if you just couple those two things together. Now, what, what is the downside? So we have really cheap heat, lovely, comfortable homes. It's capital intensive. It does cost money to do, and, and that's, that's really the challenge, and we're, we're trying to work around some of those challenges. And really, Super Homes is a collaboration between ourselves, the funders in terms of SEAI, ESB in terms of development and helping us develop the process, um, and ourselves in terms of the, the delivery team on the ground. And we, we have five engineers working hard to, to help people uh, through this process. So just a couple of quick slides and results. Before and after BER, most of the houses are getting to uh, um, halfway between A2 and A3, so about 67 is the average from about 220, um, so a D2. Um, in terms of the, the carbon intensity, so I think it's important to maybe Look at, uh, obviously a heat pump is driven by the electricity and that's based on the fuel mix that's currently going into the electricity grid. So if we take an oil home, it's about, by the time the oil goes through the boiler and comes out the far side, 
about 300 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour of heat into the house. If we take a gas boiler, um, marginally better obviously in terms of carbon emissions at about 240. And a heat pump in today's world uh, with our current generation mix in 2015 would be about 150, so a 50% cut. So this is outside obviously of bringing down the heat load in the house from, from insulation measures. However, if we take the 2035 um, air grid study for what our electricity mix will be in 2035, and we apply that to the home, it is uh, about 35 grams. So that's a 90% cut. So these homes, even after the energy efficiency, which is probably taking 30 or 40% of the, the heat load down, you're taking another 90% of the, of the remaining 65%. So significantly lower carbon and 2050 ready. In terms of cost, so obviously we're bringing down the amount of kilowatt hours for, for each home to use, but the kilowatt hours they do use, um, using you know, about 55% day rate, 45% night rate, um, with today's electricity prices, just under three and a half cent per kilowatt hour. And that's very, very similar in terms of, that, that is being driven by the efficiency of a heat pump, just like the cost per kilometer of an EV is a fraction of a diesel car, it's the same, it's, it's the thermal efficiency, the laws of physics in the unit of a heat pump that, that really drives down the cost. So what you have there in that case is, people can afford to use a few more kilowatt hours, it's pretty low carbon, and you end up with a very high thermal comfort level in the house, you have a very high um, satisfaction rating because they can do that for probably on average about 400 euros for a 200 square meter house. So we're moving that on, our next stage is, is Super Homes 2, and I'm, I'm reliably informed someone is writing a research proposal for Super Homes 3, which I, I don't want to get into just yet because I haven't got my head around Super Homes 2. Um, this is funded by the IERC, which is, which is a collaboration of the Department of Energy and, and Jobs. Um, and it's to, to look at how we can use heat pumps as part of the future smart grid. So obviously we want to try and um, optimize the, the heat pump in the house, whatever PV is, is available in the house to try and obviously use the sun when the sun is shining. So even in the winter time, we'll have a little bit of excess solar electricity this afternoon because you're all here and not in your house. Um, and to switch on the heat pump and dump that heat, multiply by 3.5, or dump that solar electricity, multiply by 3.5 and into your, into your home. Obviously then we want to look at pay as you go and, and time of use, sorry, time of use um, of the heat pump and using that to sh load shift heating from when the grid is not, uh, or when the grid is, is, is at high, high utilization to when the grid is at low utilization. And we're, we've installed some smart meters and we're working with networks to try and uh, figure out how to balance all of those. Um, so really, the last slide I have is just in terms of a call to action. I, I, I'm, I'm told that you should never do a presentation without, or a, a business case without asking people to do something when they walk away. Um, I think it's important the state listens to the Citizens' Assembly and takes charge. Um, and I, I'm delighted to hear ESB's um, future vision of how they will take charge of, 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 of their part of that pie. Um, we're currently incentivizing um, oil and gas boilers, which is great to hear they're going to be phased out. Um, the fossil fuels are still going into new build. About 35% of, of, of homes are going in with heat pumps. We, we need to make that 100%. Um, we need to make sure we have financing piling into this place. Um, we need to make sure that society is clear on what needs to happen and what the future should look like, so we need to see demonstration. Um, and you know, I think the electricity as a future, as a clean future, you know, we do still need to see microgeneration. generation um, we need to see smart meters that communicate with people, and that was my question earlier on. Um, and lots of other stuff that were in development and, and demonstration um, about making sure that the smart, clean, electric future is clear to all of society and, and not just in, in the heads of, of uh, some of the people in the room. So that's, um, I'm 46 seconds over, so apologies, Matt. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Now, our next speaker is one of the best-known names in the global energy sector. 
Michael Liebreich is the founder of Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and he's now a senior contributor there, and it's relied upon by energy leaders around the world. He also sits on the Board of Transport for London, although he's not speaking on its behalf today. What he is going to do for us is draw on his incredible background to provide us with insights on the key trends in energy finance and the electrification of public transport. So would you please welcome Michael Liebreich. Thank you very much. Um, it's a, an honour and a privilege to be back here. This is actually the third time that I've addressed the IIEA. And um, I thought I'd start, when I was preparing my remarks today, by going back to see, well, what did I actually say the first time I spoke to IIEA? And, um, and I came across this very striking chart that you can see there, 2012, five years ago, and I said this, that we're in the process of a fundamental re-engineering of the world's energy industry around low carbon, more secure solutions and architecture. Right? What have we been hearing about all of today? Essentially that. Uh, it will cost trillions. Uh, I didn't mean just here in Ireland. Um, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, it will take decades, and I don't mean just here in Ireland. Um, and it will be funded largely by the capital markets. And I think one of the themes here today has been the role of the um, state or semi-state organization. Uh, but it's very clear that around the world, the cost of this transition, or in fact, these transitions, because energy, I'm also talking about the energy used in uh, transportation, the cost is so substantial, it is not in the gift of governments to give. Uh, and then I left with a question five years ago. I said, the question is, how fast will this happen? Uh, so I thought we could usefully sort of report back and see, well, what do we think? Uh, how do we think we're doing uh, since that time five years ago? So five years ago, I also showed this chart. This was the money uh, flowing into... Now, this was a definition of clean energy, which we've used for uh, now, I think, 13 or 14 years. So it's renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, carbon capture and storage, not that anybody's doing any of it, uh, but also power storage, smart grid, all of the things that an investor can invest in in order to uh, accelerate or, or to take part in this transition. It doesn't include uh, nuclear or natural gas, not because they won't be important, but that this is just uh, uh, the, the, the definition we started using. So we get a nice clean signal about how much money and where is it going. So that was what we saw uh, five years ago. This very rapid uh, growth from 60 billion to around 300, in fact, 317 uh, billion dollars, nearly a third of a trillion dollars uh, that, uh, growth between 2004 and the latest data when I came this, that first time here to, to Dublin, and it was uh, 2011, uh, 317 billion. So what have we seen since then? Well, when I came back three years ago, that was where we were. So you could say, well, it looks like it might have stalled. Still 315 billion bounces around a bit. And where have we been since then? Well, I'll give you three more years, including our estimate for the end, the outturn uh, for this year, and you can see it's, broadly speaking, around the same, 300 billion mark, uh, now for eight years. So the financing of the transition to clean energy appears to have stalled, but what you see is the amount, the installed capacity of renewable energy over that period has continued to grow. So if you look at that historical period now of, uh, of, of 14, 13, 14 years, you can very clearly see that there are two periods. First period was spend more, get more. And you could call it subsidize more, get more. If you wanted more clean energy, you just paid more. But then there's this second period where you actually spend the same and you get double. And that's going to continue uh, uh, we believe, out into the future. And of course, the reason for that is that the costs of renewable energy technologies across the board have been falling and falling very dramatically during that second period. Here's another chart that I showed that first time I came here. It's very brave. This, it's very hard to remember how brave it was to say that the best wind farms, onshore wind, cost no more per kilowatt hour of electricity than new coal or than gas if the price of gas was $6 per million BTU. This was 
absolutely not accepted uh, by mainstream media. I got a lot of incoming flags. I know that's ridiculous. It can't possibly be true. Everybody knows that renewable energy is, uh, in the words of many members of the uh, of, of government in the UK at the, at the time and since, ludicrously expensive. It's not called renewable energy. It's called ludicrously expensive renewable energy. So showing something like this was actually controversial. Now, at the time, here you've got um, solar, uh, onshore wind, offshore wind. These are the world record prices. These are the sort of Usain Bolt projects in their uh, categories. Back in 2012, you can see that solar, the best in the world, 17 cents per kilowatt hour. It's not that long ago, 2012. It's really not that long ago. And then uh, onshore wind, 8 cents. Uh, on, uh, off, onshore, eight cents. Offshore, 17 cents. Um, if you just fast forward to 2015, then already solar, there was a project uh, in Abu Dhabi. A lot of people thought it couldn't be delivered profitably. It was a ridiculous price, uh, 5.84 cents. Uh, onshore wind was then around five cents, the best projects in the world, and offshore, 12 cents. That's only two, three years ago. What happened since then? So that was when I was back the second time. What happened then was this. Offshore wind, five cents. Solar, the world record, down to 2.99. Onshore wind, down to three. Solar, 2.91, 2.74, 2.69. Offshore wind, unsubsidized offshore wind, not requiring a subsidy at 4.9 cents per kilowatt hour. Solar, 1.79, it's a bit of a fake bit of a tailwind at that, uh, I think that's not quite the Usain Bolt world record because there may have been some subsidies, but around two cents, let's call it, and then onshore wind, uh, two cents. So these are the world records, and clearly we're not talking about solar photovoltaics in Ireland matching in any way the sorts of costs you'll see in Saudi Arabia or Abu Dhabi. I mean, uh, we, talk, we heard a little bit about the weather forecast for 2050. I don't think it's going to get quite that extreme. Um, but what we have seen is that those record prices within two, three years tend to become the median prices for these projects around the world. And so particularly if you look at onshore wind, you look at offshore wind, there's no reason to believe that in maybe not two, three years, maybe five years, maybe seven years, but not longer than that, those sorts of prices, two cents, five cents, unsubsidized, these are unsubsidized prices, should be achievable here in Ireland. Now, it's all down to this thing. I can't ever resist showing an experience curve. And the reason I do this is that most energy economists are fundamentally resource economists. Right? They're into you know, digging things out or extracting them from, from, uh, from under the ground. And what they do is you know, they work out you know, cost curves and marginal uh, cost of extraction. And then you get some depletion. Uh, and you get dispatch curves. And they're really good at that stuff. The problem for them is that these technologies are manufacturing technologies. They are material science technologies. And they are information science technologies. They have different economics. They get cheaper the more you do. They don't ever go up in cost the more you do. The experience curve that we see in energy, it's the, if you look at the Moore's law curve in semiconductors, it's a variant or a special case of the same curve that we see in wind, solar, and by the way, we'll see one in batteries, but it could be smart meters, anything, all of these technologies. So wind, you'll see there, 19%. Every time the world doubles its experience in wind, we'll see the cost coming down 19%. In solar, the most recent analysis from my colleagues at BNF, 24 to 28%, one of the steepest experience curves I've seen in any industry. And the reason is it's all about material science and then turbocharged with big data and analytics and digitization. So if you go back to the 2005, when I started New Energy Finance, or a year, a year after, that's what a solar farm looked like. It now looks like that, and it's all optimized digitally. And if you look at wind, when I started New Energy Finance, a four megawatt turbine was an absolute monster. That was the biggest turbine that you could see. They were only experimental at that time. And then... Over the years intervening, seven megawatts, nine megawatts there, nearly as tall as the Eiffel Tower. And that very cheap offshore wind 
The reason, one of the reasons it's very cheap is this. That's how tall it is. That's the shard in London. So my mum doesn't actually know what I do. Uh, and I showed her this, and she said, that's very interesting. She said, but why would you build it in front of the shard? <laughs> <laughs> So the other reason why this stuff has become cheap is because price signals matter. Businesses compete on whatever, you, whatever job you set, whatever dimensions you set for them to compete, whether it's tickets to Wimbledon or price competition, that's what they do. And when you go from feed-in tariffs to reverse auctions, they start to compete on price. They want to win those auctions. And so you can see that immediately around the world, around a one-third drop in price when you go from feed-in tariff to reverse auctions, and then over time, 60% uh, uh, drop. As companies sharpen their pencils, compete on price, price signals matter. How you structure policy, policy matters. So what do we see now? We see coal uh, around the world having peaked. Um, it's not just renewable energy, of course, it's also natural gas in the US, we'll see, and it's energy efficiency, but coal has peaked. And this is an, uh, a quotation from the minister, not, he, this is not an activist, and this is not the minister of renewable energy, he was also the minister of uh, coal uh, new and renewable energy, but also mines, uh, Piyush Goyal, actually he's now the minister of railway, uh, railways. In India it's a massive promotion to be uh, promoted from energy to railways. Um, but the cost of solar power is now cheaper than coal in this country. Um, so very mainstream has now caught up with what I was saying five years ago, that renewable energy is competitive. And in fact now, renewable energy sits at the bottom of the cost stack. The EU. Um, so this is the top 10 coal-using countries in the EU, and tragically, there's only one country which has really significantly, amongst these top 10, that has really significantly reduced coal use historically already, and that is uh, the dirty man of Europe, as it used to be called, uh, the UK. And this is the history of coal use in the UK. Um, the, the plan is to be completely off it by uh, 2025, I think, at the latest, uh, but probably 2023. And you can see there the Industrial Revolution, so it grows. You can see the general strikes. You can see it coming down. You can see the 1984 miners' strike. And then you can see the end of coal. This is the future history, and this has to be the future history of coal around the world if we're to stay within that climate envelope that we've heard about a number, from a number of speakers um, today. And thank you for, you, you have a slide on it, I don't, but, I will, but I'll, I'll give you uh, credit for reminding the audience that there is this uh, um, uh, climate um, emissions budget or emissions envelope within which we're told we have to operate. This is what coal needs to look like. In Germany, Energie Vendor Central, they've decided to shut nuclear and not shut coal. So the energy vendor has, de facto, by the facts, by the output, prioritized the shutting of nuclear over the climate. And they absolutely hate when I tell them that, but it's absolutely clear, because if you look at the, you see the power sector emissions, uh, they have been flat for around 20 years. And the negotiations, one of the reasons why the negotiations for the, uh, the, the, the government after the most recent elections, one of the reasons why they failed is that the two parties, the FDP and the, and the Greens, couldn't agree on rapidly shutting coal. You know, we have to stop, you know, uh, trying to find ways around it. We have to shut coal um, uh, to fit within uh, the, 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 this, this planetary boundary and also all the targets at Paris and so on. Now, interestingly enough, it will get shut anyway. And the reason is, this is our forecast for the EU ETS price. Remember, the EU ETS, which we sort of tend to forget because it's at such low levels, five, seven euros, it will go up, the prices will go up, unless there are explicit extra programs to shut coal in European countries. So the choices are really to let the EU ETS do it or to have a measured plan with transition for those communities affected and so on. US, so this is the US uh, generation mix. There you can see 
Black is coal, and it was uh, forced out. This was the so-called war on coal. Um, where did it go? Well, it went, as I mentioned, to natural gas. You can see the gray. It went to efficiency, the green, and also to renewables. Coal has been losing to all three of them. Now, President Trump, we all know, uh, I, think, I think he said that um, President Trump digs coal was the, uh, the phrase used during the election, and he's, he's uh, made a big, uh, put a big a stake in the ground about uh, helping coal miners find jobs and to restore the fortunes of the US's coal industry. Um, and um, here you have Secretary Perry, who uh, has been trying to support coal-fired power stations in the US. Um, he first uh, produced a study to show how awful renewables were and how they were damaging the resilience of the grid. The answer he got, he didn't like, so he sort of ignored it. Um, and then he's given an instruction to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, as a first step, it is particularly urgent to prevent premature retirement of the resources that have critical attributes. And everybody's trying to work out what the critical attributes are in terms of resilience. Uh, and, and they're actually, uh, the critical attributes are basically huge piles of coal. Um, but it's really not going to work. Uh, this is Texas, which is not covered by FERC. In fact, there is, there's a, uh, FERC will have a, that might have some impact in one of the markets in the US, the, the so-called PGM market, where there's a lot of coal. But as you go around the US, whether it's Texas, whether it's California, you find that actually uh, this, the, 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 this rule, the huge pile of piles of, of coal rule will be ineffective. These are three power stations that have uh, announced closure since the announcement of that, uh, that rule. Uh, these ones in Texas, you can see that they add together to be around five gigawatts, but the coal closures are uh, continuing. So this is Scott Pruitt, the EPA administrator, and what he said is, um, you know, the war on coal is over. And you know what? He's absolutely right. Coal lost. <laughs> so where are we? We've got at the moment in the energy mix, for all the people saying that renewables are, are insignificant in primary energy, primary energy mainly me measures waste. I don't know why people talk about it. This is the electricity mix, wind and solar today, uh, or um, actually, um, I think that was uh, 2014. No, it was, it was published in 2014. It's around 4%. Um, the IEA forecasts that by 2040 it'll be 16%, BNEF 34%. So we're more bullish than the International Energy Agency and the big forecasters. I actually think this is not quite up to date. IEA has just published uh, their World Energy Outlook um, 2017, and I think the 16 is closing on our 34. I think it's now up to 24%. So around a quarter of electricity in 2040, according to the IEA, and 34%, a third, according to BNEF, is going to be wind and solar globally. Right? Variable renewables. Um, one of the reasons why we're more bullish is the idea of tipping points. So we are currently in what we call tipping point one. And tipping point one says we need more electricity. Either we're a developing country growing, or maybe we're a developed country that are swapping out, a, um, I'm trying not to use the word money point, but a coal-fired power station, and we need to replace that demand. And the cheapest thing we can do, as we've seen, is wind or solar. The cheapest thing already for incremental. Now, the grid has to be able to, we'll talk about variability in a second. But there's also tipping point two. And tipping point two is where you say, I've got a CCGT power station, I've got a perfectly uh, mid-life, let's say, coal-fired power station, maybe a nuclear power station, um, but it's actually cheaper to build new wind and solar, take the hit on the capital cost, have no fuel costs, and shut down the existing generating capacity on the economics. Right? Now, if you think about that in terms of an accessible market, now you're not just going for incremental power or where you shut something down because it's end of life. Now, all of your power demand is potentially in play. That's the second tipping point. What it translates into is it says that on the generating side, we're looking at $10 trillion that's going to be spent globally between now and 2040, and around $6 trillion, more than $6 trillion, uh, will be spent on wind and solar. 
There'll be huge uh, uh, flows of capital into wind and solar. Nuclear, we've got, we expect some, depending on technology, depending on, on, on countries' geostrategic ambitions, so hydro. Gas, for flexibility, not for bulk power, because it's not competitive for bulk power. It is competitive for flexibility, and relatively little in coal. And that boom in investment, I was delighted when I checked into my hotel, I found this magazine uh, by the bedside table, and I can see that this boom in investment uh, is also going to come to Ireland. This, uh, it says here, here comes the solar gold rush. Tremendous. Of course, it was you know, pouring with rain as I went to my hotel, so I wasn't entirely convinced by this. And of course, what you don't want is a solar gold rush. What you want is the sort of considered uh, approach which integrates these resources in a rational way. Now, what that does, though, whether it's a quarter or whether it's a third of variable renewables, it really changes the structure of electricity, the structure of supply. Now, we did this for Germany. I didn't have time to do this uh, for Ireland, but I'm sure somebody has, and if not, then they will. Go back to the past, the comfortable past. Germany, you can see there, you've got sort of base load and peak, base load and peak, long lunch hours, take Friday afternoon off. Very simple. Currently... If you look at how much wind and solar, the wind is then in blue and the solar is in, in yellow, it's a much more difficult thing to manage, much more dynamism and you may have to intervene and you've got more software and you have to actually invest and you have to be more skilled and more dynamic in your management of the grid. But look what happens in the future. This is based on Germany's plans for ongoing renewable investment and you start to see things like no base load. You can't have base load. A plant you can't switch off is as difficult to manage as a solar or wind plant that you can't rely on. It causes you as much trouble. You've got these huge ramp rates, morning and night, or when the wind starts, when the wind stops. Um, and you've got to have interconnections because the excess capacity in windy, sunny times is not a bug, it's a feature. So you better, know, you better use that power, you better be on good terms with your neighbours because you want to get money for that excess power. Uh, another way of putting it is, be nice to your neighbours, you never know when you want them to act like a battery. If that's not scary enough, I'll show you this one, California, I did the same exercise, but I didn't, a very brilliant chap from LM Power did, uh, and you can see there, uh, that's the first week of May 2012, that's 2017, and over there you can see if they just do what they're planning in terms of renewable uh, capacity and uh, renewable penetration, they want to get to 50% and so on, then that's what they're going to get. Now that looks like an amazing battery market, right, because you've got to deal with that amount of solar on the system. That's probably not going to be Ireland, because it's not going to be solar, you're going to have a lot more wind, but the issues, how you manage it, those issues are coming home in, in a big way in this time frame. Now, how do you do that? This is, uh, you have to balance the grid. Um, one thing I would say is you've got to balance it right across the year. You know, with a lot of stuff around demand response, flexibility, even batteries that we've heard about is great for the kind of shorter, maybe seconds, minutes, hours, maybe days. But don't forget, and that's maybe a topic for some other uh, session, don't forget you've got seasonal variations as well. Uh, and that's much harder to know. Then you have to do long distance interconnections, chemical storage, some other solutions uh, for seasonal. Um, one of the, there are, I'm going to talk about two things that will really help with this balancing. Um, one will be vehicles, the other digitization. And in fact, you need both, but luckily they're both uh, very powerful trends. Uh, when I spoke in 2015, I showed this. I said, look, I'm really bullish about electric vehicles, but let's just be sensible. Uh, that, that you can see there, is the fleet of internal combustion vehicles. That, drawn to scale in 2015, was electric vehicles. Uh, luckily, I was, I, was, I was right. I think we've seen this enormous growth in electric vehicles. Uh, the situation is completely transformed. We're, all very, we're now all very bullish about uh, electric vehicles. Um, and, and, and so now this, I can update this chart. I've updated it, and it looks like that. <laughs> okay. However, we are very bullish. We've got much better data and understanding now on the battery experience curve. Uh, here you can see battery prices down 70% in the last five or six years. They're going to go down another 70% between now and 2030. They'll get to the point where not just total cost of ownership, 
but actual showroom sticker price, electric vehicles will be cheaper than non-electric. Sticker price, you just want to walk out of your, or drive out of your showroom in a vehicle, and electric will be cheaper than internal combustion. Why? They're very simple, not that many moving parts. The only expensive thing is the battery, and the battery price is doing that. Air quality. We've seen a number of cities around Europe banning internal combustion engines because of air quality. This is London. There's the shard. You can see it. I show this to my mum. So look, no, no wind turbine. Um, not yet, anyway. Um, but, but the air quality issue is not going away. And it's not going away until we take action. And it is about coal, and it is about diesel, and then some other things. And uh, action is being taken. And countries are following their cities. Mayors are taking the lead, but countries we now see banning or, or, or uh, threatening to ban or uh, internal combustion, pure internal combustion car sales. Um, Netherlands, Norway by 2025, France, UK 2040, India, China 2030, and so on. So policymakers see which way the wind is blowing, uh, and they are backing uh, this trend largely for air quality reasons, also industrial strategy. In 2008, if you wanted to buy an electric car, you had a choice of two. It was either a Tesla Roadster or a golf buggy. 2009, a bit more choice. These are different types of electric, uh, certain types of cars from uh, SUVs at the top and sports cars. 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And by 2020, very extensive range. These cars will look, will make internal combustion cars look very silly and old-fashioned, frankly. Um, this chart is out of date. I can't keep up with the announcements. Volkswagen, Volvo, Daimler, etc., etc., and it doesn't include models available in India or China. There are over 250 models uh, worldwide by 2020. And so we're going to see these cars will be sold, more than 50% of global sales by 2040, based on those trends. The fleet will be more than one-third electric. So one-third renewable electricity, one-third electric vehicles around us in the fleet. And by the way, the whole economy will be one-third more uh, energy efficient, more energy productive. There will be charging points. You can see there the rate of growth of charging points. And there will be batteries. Uh, there's a lot of talk about bottlenecks. There are some short-term bottlenecks, lithium uh, and, uh, and, and cobalt. Um, but this is what we saw when solar took off. Some of you in the room will remember the silicon bottleneck. Uh, the silicon bottleneck, there was not enough silicon to go around all the manufacturers, and we saw the price spike. We were tracking this, uh, and the prices spiked from $20, pounds, uh, uh, $20 a kilo uh, up to $400. And then, of course, they drop. There was no inherent shortage of silicon. There's no inherent shortage of lithium uh, or cobalt or the other metals. And we're going to see a similar sorts of spikes, maybe not as high or whatever. But by 2040, not an issue. Um, if anybody thinks it's going to be fuel cells, let me show you this. This is uh, drawn to scale, because I like doing that, you know. Electric vehicle sales, that is fuel cell vehicle sales. Um, <laughs> If you need a magnifying glass, I'll send you the charts. And, but there's a reason why the fuel cell is a bad solution for short distance transport. And the reason is this. If you have electricity, right? this is called wind to wheel. Right? If you have that electricity, and then you have to convert it into DC and do some things and whatever, you put it in a battery, and you use it for motive power in your vehicle, you're using 60% of the energy content. If you use that electricity and you convert it, you use it for electrolysis into hydrogen, and then you have to compress it and store it and move it and compress it and store it and move it, and then you have to stick it in a fuel cell, even if it's a 60% efficient fuel cell, you're going to get out 30%. If you have electricity and you want to go somewhere, stick it in a battery and go somewhere. Don't do some chemical conversions. Right. Hydrogen might have a role in that seasonal storage or some other things, but it isn't in short distance transport, or medium, short to medium distance. Now, transportation, I was asked to talk about transportation in the city. I'm just very conscious I'm very low on time, but these are buses. Same thing is happening. All of the manufacturers are rushing to produce electric buses. Um, transport for London, I think in London, we think we've got the largest fleet of electric buses in Europe. 
I believe that's true. We've got 120, I think, now. Uh, this is China. Sales of electric buses last year, 140,000. We are simply not, none of us in Europe, we are nowhere near the cutting edge on this stuff. Um, I was just recently in Turkey. They have three manufacturers making electric buses. This one on the left really is a monster. It's a double articulated uh, electric bus. So this is taking off around the world. In the US, they have a company called Proterra. Electric buses are, you know, the, the, I don't want to say they are the solution because I have to stay somewhat impartial. We have some fuel cell buses as well in London. Um, but this is happening. This is the direction of travel. Digitization. Really powerful trends. I don't think I need to go through them. We all know something is happening. It's ubiquitous chips and sensors, ubiquitous communications, ubiquitous processing in the cloud, but also at the edge of the network. And now machine learning and bots and, and big data analytics and so on. Something is happening and it's transforming energy transport and infrastructure. We already see the fruits of that in services, Google Maps, Go to a strange city, you can actually walk to places because of Google Maps. You didn't used to be able to do that. That is changing transport. Um, you've got their city mapper. Uh, even Vodafone is involved, or the mobile phone companies, because they can help uh, providing data on, on where your phone is and so on. You've got Waze, Wayfinder helping disabled people to move around in ways they couldn't uh, previously. We're already seeing this. This is happening uh, now. It's transform transformative. Ride hailing. It's very often portrayed as a battle between taxis and the, uh, the, 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 the dreaded Uber and Lyft and et cetera. This is the reality in the US. Look at that. That's the number of licensed taxis and Uber and Lyft. What's happening is that these services are unlocking new demand for personal uh, 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 driver-enabled uh, travel. Again, transformational uh, and, and not going to stop. We've got, we, I'm very proud of this one because we've just sold our contactless payment system. We're going to see an integration of energy and transport and finance. By the way, if any of those go down, cyber or whatever, we're in trouble. But we have sold our contactless payment system to New York and now uh, to Boston as of a couple of days ago. And we're going to see innovations integrating infrastructure, energy, transport, and so on. Uh, blockchain, we're already seeing some experiments in shipping, in trucking, supply chain, Walmart, customs. Who knows? Hopefully, uh, that will be uh, maybe part of the solution to the, the very pressing issue on the, the, the border here on the island. Um, so we're going to see this sort of innovation. And then, of course, this. I don't call it the evolution of car, of transport. I call it the evolution of driver technology. Um, that's current generation, and that's the future generation. Uh, they actually call it the auto chauffeur. It's a bit cheeky. Um, and this is the big topic. It will reinforce the trends to electric uh, transportation, because it allows cars to go off and be charged and come back without wasting anybody's time. You no longer worry about the charge taking 20 minutes or half an hour or happening a few miles away if you've got the NVIDIA uh, drive, which costs nothing at the incremental level. I'm a bit skeptical about driverless, um, and I'll, I'll do this quickly. You can see there, that. that's the number of miles between interventions of the current generation of driverless data from California. The average UK, the average uh, US human has a big shunt about once every 500,000 miles, not once every 5,000 miles. And if we give control to a bus driver or to a train or to an aeroplane, we expect even more safety, not a factor of one or two or three. Uh, Elon Musk talks about driverless being twice as safe. 50 times is, is the sort of target that those, these systems need to achieve. In total, we're looking at technology that has to be 5,000 times better than today. Now, that might take a year, it might take two years, it might take 10 years. I'm somewhat skeptical about the time frame. Um, Uber has just announced it's bought 24,000 driverless Volvos for delivery 2019 to 21. Presumably, they believe that 2019 to 21 will see this technology mature enough to be released on the streets. I remain to be convinced. Um, but the press release was very impressive. Um, 
And I worry about some of the things that don't sort of get talked about a lot. You know, what do you do when 20,000 people all say that they're going to watch Adele at the O2, who was fantastic, by the way, uh, but they all want to go at the same time, and all they've got is a pin, and who allocates them to different drop-off points and so on? Is that going to be the public authorities? Or is that going to somehow magically happen in the app or in the, at the level of that NVIDIA board? Nobody knows. Algorithms that are individually incredibly smart and uh, collectively incredibly dumb, sounds perhaps like humans, but uh, there's no reason to believe that artificial humans will necessarily be smarter than real humans. Uh, and then uh, this issue, when rich people have their cars drive around the block instead of parking. Parking's expensive. Uh, and so you just say, drive around and around while I have my meeting. Now, these are problems that have to be solved. This is what uh, the public authorities are thinking about, how, because this transition to driverless electric, it could be fantastic. The electric bit will certainly help to manage that variability. Uh, electrification not only is good for the climate, the more of it you have, the more you can do your demand response and use the power from your wind and your solar. But this transition on the transport side can either be done in a, an extremely socially effective way, inclusion and services for disabled, elderly, people who are not comfortable driving in cities, uh, or it can be done in such a way as to promote vast amounts of gridlock uh, and a very poor outcome uh, societally. And how it plays out will actually be up to all of you in the audience and your colleagues in the equivalent transportation-focused uh, events. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. We're now going to have our discussion on the all-electric forum. But before we do so, our third poll of the day, please, on Slido. Uh, I want you to answer, how many retrofit measures have you undertaken in your home? Is it A, zero, B, one to two, C, three or four, or D, five or more? So give us your answers, please. And look at you, over a third of you have done nothing. I would have thought this was the audience that would have been doing five and more, but there you go. Those are the answers coming up. Okay, we're going to talk about the all-electric. How many have you done? <coughs> How many have I done? I don't know. I'm only asking questions around here. <laughs> anyway. I'm fascinated, Michael, by what you say. I just want to pick up the point at the end about the driverless cars. Because the speed of change going on is so fast at present. I actually have come to believe in driverless cars, which will all be electric, within five to ten years. And here's why. Back at the turn of the century, just 1999, the Americans decided that they needed to put all of the satellites that they had in space for their nuclear capability for war onto a single mainframe computer system. It was the biggest individual project ever done by the Americans at the time. They spent a small fortune on it, and they got everything into the one computer system. The computing power in that system from 1999 is now in the PlayStation 4 that you would have underneath your television that your kids play on. That's the pace of change that is taking place. And Michael, that's why I suspect that things like driverless cars, while even at the moment, yes, maybe there's a driver intervention every 500 miles, that in two to three years' time, that's just going to have changed completely. Yeah, so I think that's entirely, uh, you know, the technology, in a sense, doesn't worry me as much as how you have to change the city architecture. So it's, it, it, you know, do we have to change the way that the traffic lights are, um, you know, are, are sequenced? So it's those sorts of questions um, that will take a lot longer, or how do you deal, how do you make sure, as a, and, you know, th there will be regulators involved, how do you make sure um, that edge cases are taken into account? So what, do you, what happens if you order your completely driverless car and uh, an elderly person can't get their luggage in, or it can only drop them off one and a half miles away from the O2? And, and those sorts of things also have to be solved. You can't just say, well, we'll just release these things, it'll all be fine. Um, because th they may not be fine. They may end up with gridlock or they may end up with um, say public safety issues uh, and, uh, and so on. So, and I, I believe those, those edge cases are not just two or three. They're many, many. 
Okay, but take as well... You so say... I'm, I'm very optimistic on the technology, don't get me wrong. Yeah. It'll happen. The only question is, is it going to be 2031 or 2021? And I'm more of a sort of, you know, late 20s, maybe... Tw but, but, but for fully feral, you know, just roaming cars with no driver in them that you call with an app and they can go anywhere in the city, that's a very challenging, that, that's a very challenging um, uh, system to, to approve. It'll all be done on the cloud. But can I also put it to you, we're very interested in the cost falling of construction of alternative energy sources. So for things like electric buses, trains as well, we have a deficit in this country of public transport. We had an enormous amount of rain yesterday, which brought the city here and outside of Dublin to a standstill. Uh, journey times three times their usual level because 80% of the traffic coming into Dublin is cars, where yep. it should be less than 50. It should probably even be done about 20%. So if the cost of actually constructing the facilities for giving us the alternative energy drops, will the cost of the buses and the trains and the capital infrastructure drop as well to suit their connection? Well, the, the cost of the batteries will drop, and there's just not that much more. What, what is an electric vehicle? It's a battery. It's a battery and a mobile phone and a few motors and a suspension system. So it's a, the answer is that stuff will get cheap. What I would, it, but what, what's going to happen, though, over that time period is that um, the, 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 what, is a, what is a bus route is going to change as well. I mean, I look at, we've got Crossrail, uh, Crossrail, which is, going to, which is the, the east-west rail uh, underground that's uh, going to open in 2018, start opening in 2018. First proposed in 1941, um, construction started in, uh, in, in um, 2012, and now we're talking about Crossrail uh, 3, another one, which presumably will take another 20 years to, to happen. If you've got, if you can have large-scale vehicles at surface, that can, because of this technology, move that close with very narrow lanes and so on. Why do you need, why do you need uh, rail infrastructure? The, 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 but, but what you have to do is you have to make sure that you've got big, full vehicles on those yeah. constrained roads. So if you get that technology right, it's pretty easy to see a, cr a great solution. But if you get it wrong, then everybody, a driverless car is gonna be cheaper to take than a bus. So why wouldn't you take one? And of course, if everybody makes that decision, you get solution B, which is much, much, much worse. It's gridlock. Okay, there are questions coming in. And Pat, there's a couple of questions which are to you. They're linked. One, will money points stop burning coal? The number one and most significant single step we could take to reduce our carbon footprint. What's taking so long? Linked to that, what's the plan to replace money point? And what percentage of electricity in Ireland has currently been generated there? Okay, well, maybe I'll start. I think just so money point is <coughs> maybe a little over twenty percent of uh, uh, of electricity generated. Um, I, I suppose uh, in, in looking at money point, and it's it's a big question. It's a big question that that obviously ESB has to consider. I suppose it's important to look at the ETS and the role of the ETS. So the ETS is going to bring about uh, an elimination of carbon from the electricity generation sector by twenty fifty. It's designed to do that. Um, but I suppose it depends on you know on asking the question: What's what, what, what's is it is it to reduce Ireland's carbon emissions or is it to reduce Europe's carbon emissions? Uh, the other the other piece of the jigsaw is of course fuel diversity of supply from a security point of view and from uh, I suppose an end user price uh, perspective and money point today coal plays a role in both security of supply and in terms of keeping prices down. So in the transition to a zero carbon electricity generation system by 2050. It's important that affordability and security supply are kind of a key part of, of that transition. So that dilemma of sustainability, the classical dilemma of sustainability, affordability, and security kind of comes into play. But so if we, if we shut money point tomorrow, uh, there, there, there's, a, there, there's an economic impact in terms of end user prices. There's an impact on security and diversity of fuel supplies. But it, it reduces Ireland's carbon emissions, but it doesn't reduce Europe's carbon emissions. That's because of the nature of the ETS. It just allows Germany or Poland to burn coal. There's a cap, a European cap. The ETS is capped at European level, not at a country level. Uh, so I suppose closing money point before is an e e economically right to do is not the right thing for Ireland. 
But, you know, we are, we are actively looking at Money Point and we will actively manage out of coal and out of peat over the next decade. You know, money, uh, coal, we see the EU ETS price, the bike of coal is on borrowed time. So, you know, any time after the middle of the next decade, you're going to see a ramp down and, uh, like, coal, coal will ramp down. So, you know, you can't say for definite, but it's important in considering, you know, Money Point, what are you trying to achieve in closing Money Point? What would replace it in, in, in Ireland, but what are you trying to achieve? And as I said, if uh, based on the ETS, it would reduce Ireland's uh, carbon emissions, but it wouldn't re reduce Europe's. Okay, Michael, there's a technical question here, I think. Will EU ETS price grow <coughs> if member states continue to subsidise renewable electricity, which dampens the ETS price? Um, so that, that question is a good question because it, um, but it is a bit technical because it's, it's to do with you know, if you have an ETS, but then you don't let it do its work, you then have a renewables directive and an energy efficiency directive, and what these do is then um, uh, depress the prices. Why bother having an EU ETS price in the first place? Um, I actually have a so the, so the answer to that is yeah you could just take your hands off the wheel and you'll get as uh, as Pat points out. The but there is another uh, another point which is. When you get this very cheap wind and solar, it wins on its own merits when it is windy or sunny. And subsidizing it more doesn't make it windier or sunnier. What you've actually got to do, if you want then more renewables in the system, you've got to then say, well, we need something else to enable the renewable energy, or the new renewable electricity, to meet the demand at night or when it's not uh, windy. And the best way to get that is not by making the wind. If, you know, that, those record prices, two cents, whether it's two cents or four cents or whatever, if you make those one cent to two cents, that doesn't help you push into the nighttime or the non-windy times. What does is batteries, demand response, electrification of heat, electrification of vehicles, uh, or simply taking out the fossil and letting the market really figure out how to keep the lights on. You have to be a brave politician to do that. Okay, a couple of questions for you, Paul, that are linked. One says, heat pumps are very efficient. How much carbon dioxide do they currently emit when compared with oil and gas boilers taking into primary delivered energy? And linked to that, uh, I think it's, it's just, yes, yeah, so it has gone, unfortunately. There was another question there that was linked to that about needing to continue to use the heat pump. Will that be possible when you have on and off electricity demand? Yeah, effectively when... There we go. Um, yeah, I guess I answered the, the CO2 question in one of the slides. So it's about a 50% cut um, from oil and about a, a, a little bit more and a little bit less for gas today. But, you know, as Pat has said, as we go over the next decade, that's going to drop to, a, to about a 90% and 85% for oil and gas. Um, in, in terms of, of the continuously, you know, uh, we've, our research project with the IRC and, and networks and, and, and Electric Ireland is is looking at how we utilize um, air source heat pumps on the market. So use the market price to drive when you heat your home. Um, and, and I've been trying, uh, trying that in my own house has been a bit of a guinea pig, but you can re reasonably see unless, uh, we design our air source heat pumps to run at minus three. So for the other 8,745 hours of the year that it isn't minus three, you can switch them off some of the time. And it's only really when it's very, very cold that you have an issue. So they'll just ramp up, they'll still be very efficient, but they'll ramp up and run a little bit higher and hotter for, for we'll say, uh, 12 o'clock in the day until 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then they'll just switch off. And you're not going to notice, because your house will hold the heat for two or three hours or four hours or five hours, and then come eight or nine in the evening, they'll, they'll come back on. Um, and yeah, we may have a particular issue for 15 or 20 or 30 hours of, of the year, but you know, if we vehicle to grid or any sort of reasonable amount of energy storage, um, I, I can see that problem being, being solved. Okay. Pat, we're not going to shy away from the awkward questions. One that says ESP is 50% generation, 50% retail, and 100% of network ownership, and is highly politically influential. So serious antitrust questions, can things really change? Uh, I'm not sure what the antitrust uh, uh, piece is about. It's quite an assertion, and it's wrong. Um, I, we, yes, we, we are in, uh, we're vertically integrated. We've generation, network, and retail. Network is regulated. Generation and retail are competitive. There are very, very stringent uh, regulatory obligations and ring fences on our business, which we must, must comply with. 
and uh, it, it is just not in our values or our DNA that we would be found wanting in respect of those ring fences. So the idea that there's serious an antitrust questions and that that is holding back any change, I, I would refute. Okay, more technical one. Do you see the adoption of micro PV solar generation battery storage for homes and businesses as a viable option going forward? Um, yeah. Are ESP in favour? Yeah, I, I, look, I do. And in, in, this, in this dimensions report that, uh, that we launched here today, um, you know, all, all, all of that is included. I, I think the important thing is that there is no single solution. Uh, so, yes, we all have vested interests and you know, so you can look at whether it's, it's an all renewable future or an all non renewable future or an all solar or an all wind or an all something else. It's going to be a mix. Sorry, it's, it's going to be a mix. Uh, so there is, no, there is no single solution. So all of that, so the, that, that, the micro PV solar will be part of a battery storage. And I think the coincidence of micro uh, solar, you know, that's solar at the level of a household and battery storage at the level of the, of the household is going to be quite a game changer. That with, with new technology, particularly around digital and the aggregation in conjunction with smart metering and smart networks is really going to allow a very, very dynamic approach to managing the whole of the value chain from production through, through to consumption in terms of peak management in, person, in, in terms of moving peaks around and in terms of pricing, giving price signals to customers in terms of when and how they use electricity. So yes, that is all part of the mix. Okay, Michael, you want to come in there? To, to, to add to that, the other piece is not just the micro PV and the battery, but also super efficient lighting and appliances, because uh, that's, a, that's the real enabler. If you take an old drafty house with old appliances and filament light bulbs, and you think, oh, we'll put PV on the roof and it'll change the world. No, obviously it won't. But if you take a really well insulated house uh, with um, a heat pump and LED lighting throughout, really good appliances throughout, then actually you can get your own PV to cover a much bigger proportion of your own demand. And then you can, uh, you can store, it's very easy to store warm water or hot water. So you can start to really play some interesting things and the scale is relevant. Uh, unlike you know, five, 10 years ago with old appliances in a drafty house, uh, and absolutely micro PV will play a part. I want to stay with you, Michael. There is somebody who suggests that spending on renewables has stagnated. Renewables doubled, yet the global pace of change is still too slow to avert climate yep. change. Oh, so uh, that, that's right. I mean, what's, we've got to remember um, that electricity is only 20% 20, 20 of final energy demand, 21, 22, something like that. And it needs to be, and that, this, this conference is actually really interesting because the idea of pushing electrification to 40, 50% doesn't come up at most forums that I attend. And, you know, that, so that's really interesting. Um, if you've got dramatic change and you really improve 20% of the problem, um, you're clearly not solving much. We've got to deal with transport. We've got to deal with heat. We've got to deal with industrial processes. We've got to deal with uh, forestry and agriculture. Uh, there's just no... And when we say transport, you, you know, there's also ships and, and, and airborne, not just land-based. So I think the answer to why it is that we can be bullish about the change but not achieving much is, well, we're bullish about the change in a segment. And I think part of the conversation here is how do you get that and, and, and expand it into 50% of the economy, not keep it in its 20% silo? And, and, and the, key, the key to that is actually just to be doing lots of things simultaneously. This isn't sequential. We're not going to solve this carbon problem sequentially. So yes, the, the electricity system is a long way from being decarbonized, but it does make sense today to use certain uh, technologies in conjunction with the electricity system with its current carbon intensity. And it's important that we just do all of these things in parallel. I want to ask you a question. It's disappeared off the screen, but I thought it was an interesting one about the experience which we referred to earlier of Irish water having such dreadful problems putting in the meters, the public reaction against it. Has that impacted on your ability to roll out smart meters? Uh, no, not at all. Um, like, like, so so the, approach, the approach that's been taken uh, with, uh, to, to smart electricity meters is you can opt in or you can opt out. And, and there is, like there's, there's 90 years of, of, of of experience with, uh, with electricity meters. 
Uh, so I, I, I think war, water metering and what happened with water metering was something that happened at a point in a time in the political cycle, uh, but it hasn't in any way kind of impacted on, on, on the time scale or how we've approached the rollout of smart electricity metering. Okay, I think that's probably a good point to wish to call a halt to this particular uh, discussion. So thank you very much to the three gentlemen involved for their presentations here today. If I could just ask them to just wait on stage a second. I think we are going to have our Tweet of the Day competition result, or oh, the winner of the Twitter competition, Roisin Moriarty. Uh, congratulations to you. You are the winner. Okay, I would like to invite one other person to come up onto the stage uh, from the Institute of International and European Affairs. We'd like to thank ESB again for its kind sponsorship of this event today, the Round Room of the Mansion House for hosting us. So would the IIEA Director General Barry Andrews please come to the stage to give us our closing remarks. Thank you, Matt. Um, so it falls to me to bring these proceedings uh, to an end. It's been an extremely engaging day of uh, discussion. It's great to have uh, Minister Nocton here, um, and one has uh, some sympathy for the position that he holds. Um, I've been reminded uh, constantly today of the degree to which energy is actually a political issue uh, on a number of occasions. Getting from where we are to the logic of uh, carbon emissions reductions to a low carbon future, will not be a linear path, and for politicians, the great challenge uh, can be summed up as follows. They know what the right thing to do is, but they just don't know how to get re-elected when they do it. And the speed of progress will be determined by the appetite for risk and innovation, but also by leadership. And leadership and political risk will be invested if thought leaders and sector actors provide uh, those political decision makers with the longest possible line of vision. Uh, today's proceedings have given us some further visibility on what lies ahead. We have heard that the market uh, requires to be segmented. We heard that the uh, science of behavioral so sociology has a lot to tell us and will anticipate popular reaction to different initiatives. But we also heard that smart metering, as seductive as it is, can be politically combustible. Uh, we heard that bill payers will not be pleased to pay for benefits that accrue uh, to the efficient operation of the utility. And we saw in the long-running saga around water how despite the compelling logic of water, meter, water meters leading to a major upgrade in our water network assets, this failed to hit the target with the general public. Finally, one strong takeaway for me today is the continuing mystery around climate change. Uh, about wh why it is that despite what is happening to our weather, despite the gross injustice of the varial imp variable impact of climate change on the poorest parts of the world, and despite the unavoidable reality that our children will literally have to pay for our profligacy, none of this is enough to trigger the political conditions for radical change for long-term benefit. And we see that in many uh, social issues, uh, we see that horizontally cutting across many questions of social activism, the inability to change the electoral equation whereby the cost of doing nothing uh, becomes higher than the cost of doing something. May I say, uh, in conclusion, one final personal note. Uh, my grandfather, Todd Andrews, was an anti-treaty IRA leader in the Civil War. Many of his contemporaries in the IRA looked with some embarrassment at the success of the Shannon scheme and the ESB and rural electrification, having been convinced for a long time that the free state government were incapable of discharging even the most basic functions of public administration. He had joined the UCD Graduates Association uh, after the Civil War, which provided a place where graduates from both sides of the political divide could discuss political issues. He was introduced to the uh, first head of the ESB, Dr. McLaughlin, by Arthur Cox, who was then the legal advisor to the ESB, and he was recruited in 1930, uh, holding, as he said himself, a more enlightened view of the ESB than some of his irregulars, uh, irregular colleagues. Of course, the rise in his salary from £300 per annum to £450 per annum might also have helped to overcome his uh, more natural political reflexes. And all of us have family history connected with the ESB. It's a great social history of this country. 
uh, and, and we really wish them well in the future. I would like to uh, think that in the same way as the UCD Graduates Association provided a place for people of all political persuasions and none to share ideas and shape policy, the Institute of International European Affairs performs that function to some extent today. So finally, can you please join me in thanking the ESB and particularly Bernadine O'Sullivan for all the wonderful work that she has done in the preparation for this conference. Also to thank on the IEA side, uh, both Jill Donahue and Max Munchmeyer for all the work that they have put in. Can I thank our excellent uh, professional MC today, Matt Cooper, uh, who's done a fantastic job. To thank all of our speakers and the Mansion House uh, for everything they have done to help us today. And thank you to all of you. We've been trending all day, so it's been a great success from that point of view. And uh, for our American colleagues, to wish them a very happy Thanksgiving. So thank you for your attention and safe home. <laughs>